I want you to just imagine the footsteps that I'm walking here. The footsteps we're walking together. These are the trails. Maybe here, probably here, these men, these mountain men have walked. We are walking in their footsteps. Hey gang, we are in Yellowstone National Park. Came in through Cody and came in the east side here. And we're now Yellowstone Lake. Beautiful, beautiful area here. Renowned. I want to take you back to the early 1800s. Here, the first white man came. Start with the Lewis and Clark Expedition, 1804-1806. There was a member of the expedition named John Coulter. We're going to be talking about the mountain men here. And he was said to be the first one that set foot in this area. He had quite an interesting story, among other things, after the Lewis and Clark. Maybe three years later, he was with one of his compatriots John Potts. Up in Montana they were captured by the Blackfeet. Quite a story of him. They had killed Potts and they looked at him and they said, can you run? And he said, no, I can't run. Little did they know he could, he, he really could run. He's like a marathon runner. He knew what was in store. He said, take your clothes off. They stripped him naked and they said, run. We're gonna, you know, it was almost like Apocalypto, we're gonna hunt you. And they, they went after him and he ran like the wind. For miles and miles and miles, he outran the Blackfeet, all the warriors, their best. His nose was bleeding, his feet were bleeding, but he made it out alive. Those mountain men had amazing stories. He was probably one of the first. You had, gosh, the, the, the companies that came in here are the first. Of course, we go all the way back to John Jacob Astor, the American Fur Company. And in this area, the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, William Henry Ashley. Ashley's 100. These famous 100 men, the mountain men. Jedediah Smith, who had his face torn off practically his ear, the grizzly bear. We had the Sublet brothers. We had Jim Bridger, you know, brings up Hugh Glass. The movie The Revenant, the fictional story, well, a big part of it was fictional. Also attacked by the grizzly bear, which we need to keep an eye out here. We are 
amongst the grizzly bears. And there was one, there's one man going back, his name, they always fascinated me, Mike Fink. Mike Fink was the king of the keel boats. They bring the keel boats from St. Louis, these companies with all their trade goods and their traps. They'd come up the Missouri and you don't just come up the Missouri by just drifting, they'd have to use the poles and push their way all the way up. And there would be logs like this and snags and things. Can you imagine trying to go hundreds, thousands of miles to the this area, the Green River Delta, and then set, set foot here and trap and trade and get the furs and just the, the hard life? Well, Mike Fink was the brawler. He was the the bully, he wanted to fight everybody. And he signed on, it is said, he was probably in his older years. He wore a red feather in his hat that said, basically it was a signal that said, come on, I'm the, I'm the tough guy. He was a practical joker. If you didn't like his jokes, he would, he would take you apart. Well, he met his end with the rendezvous, going down to Riverton and down by Jackson. The rendezvous and they would get drunk and you know that was the big time up until 1840 and he met his end he they would shoot beer or whiskey uh, stand not too far away and shoot you know shoot the glass right off the head well carpenter his longtime friend he did it but he aimed too low killed him so talbot his friend carpenter's friend got even and he got Carpenter's pistol and he killed Mike Fink, so. But all these stories, there's one that always stood out for me. Liver Eating Johnson. Have you heard of the book Crow Killer? Came out in the late 50s, I think it was, or early 60s. It was a long time ago that I read the book. Became fascinated with Liver Eating John Johnson. And he was supposedly one of these mountain men who came up on the keel boat, but really not to be. So I'm going to tell you the story of John Johnson. The book basically came out, these two authors, and they, they kind of wrote what they wanted. But it was a fabulous tale. So I'll tell you the fabulous tale, and then we'll talk a little bit about the real tale and what we've kind of uncovered as we walk along this beautiful area here in the Yellowstone. Yeah, look at the mountain out there, the snow peaks, just fabulous. This lake is just massive. The Yellowstone Lake. So there's a little foot trail here. I'm off trail and we'll keep our eye out for the, the grizzly bear. I want you to just imagine the footsteps that I'm walking here. The footsteps we're walking together. These are the trails. Maybe here, probably here, right along Yellowstone Lake. These men, these mountain men have walked. We are walking in their footsteps. So yeah, John Johnson, liver eater. It was such a tale of this man that I couldn't get over. I read the book three times, Crow Killer. Well, the story starts that he was friendly with some of the tribes, particularly the Flathead, the Flatheads. And it is said that, as the story would go by authors Thorpe and Bunker, he would end up marrying a sub-chief's daughter. They called her the Swan. And they would ride off together, kind of in the sunset into the wilderness here. And soon the Swan was pregnant and everything was going good. They settled down in a canyon and soon it was time for 
John Johnson to go. He had to trap. He had to provide for the family, right? The, the baby's coming. So, interestingly, he left. And, I mean, she was good. She was used to that. She could hunt herself. She could provide. But then it is said that some crow warriors came upon her. And of course they ambushed her and they killed her with the child, the unborn child, very violently. And John Johnson would come back and he would find the skeleton of his wife after being picked over by the crows and even the little skeleton of the little unborn child, the fetus. He would pick up the bones and put them in a kettle. In a kettle and he would hide it in a crevice. They were probably still there. I always thought to myself, where, where is that? Where are they buried? It would be so interesting to see and visit that spot that I always imagined in my mind. Well, the crow did that, and now it would be vengeance, and Liver Eater would hunt the crow, and he would kill the crow one by one. And his calling card, you know, the liver, the, the crow looked at the liver as being almost spiritual. And, you know, they would kill their game and the liver would be sacred. So liver eater would eat the liver or leave part of the liver of the crow that he killed, kind of like scalping. And that would send a sign to the crow. Well, the crow got the message. The crow got the message. And one of the chiefs, they called a council. And the chief said, bring me your, the, our bravest braves, our top warriors. And they gathered round and he said, I'm sending you 12, you 12. You're gonna go out and you're gonna kill this Johnson, this liver eater. We're gonna avenge our brothers. So according to the story, he, sent them out and the braves would one by one, it was kind of like a lifetime mission. They would go out after liver eater, but one by one, he would kill them. He'd ambush them. He would be ready for them. There's one part of the story where He would wait at his cabin and he would ambush them. In fact, he made biscuits and the biscuits smelled so good. He poisoned the biscuits and he waited outside. And the small group of these warriors came to ambush him and they smelled those biscuits. And they went inside and they're like, oh, they lost their minds. They ate the biscuits and they all died. So, at a certain point, when enough of the killing was done, there was a truce and the liver eater would become friends with the crow. He would live on in harmony. Yes. It's beautiful here. Look at this. Deadfall. Maybe from a fire. Well, interestingly, I come here to 
Yellowstone. I come to Cody. I want to do some research. I heard some rumors. Maybe this yeah, maybe this story's not true. So I went to the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. There's five museums there. It's, it's unbelievable. People come all over the world to see the history, the animals, the gun collection. So I go down to the McCracken Library and there I meet a man who I heard about, the authority on liver eater. His name, Nathan Bender, and he's there. And I meet with Nathan in the library, beautiful library there. And I said, tell me the true story, what's going on? And he laughs and he says, well, these two authors, Thorpe was the first author who wrote the initial manuscript and he used some history of John Johnson, whose real name was Garrison, I guess, and then AKA John Stun. But then I think he died or something. Well, there's other author who never even met the man named Bunker, got a hold of the manuscript. This is, I'm talking about the book Crow Killer. And he basically added all kinds of yummy stuff, stuff that it's just like, you know, fiction, storytelling. And a lot, all of that stuff, like the swan and the hunt and the revenge and the vendetta and the braves, it's all phony. He said, the liver eater, well, his, he came from New Jersey and he was uh, basically, you know, kind of a trading post guy, maybe a scout, maybe did some trapping, but he was known for being a wolfer. A wolfer, what's a wolfer? Those who trap wolves, or I should say poison the wolves. Poison the wolves with strychnine, as I recall. And, you know, he got into a lot of scrapes and a lot of stories. There were a lot of confrontations and battles, but he was actually friends with the crow. He was not enemies. It's a bunch of, a bunch of made up stuff. So I asked him, tell me more. Tell me what we do know. Now Nathan is an archivist there at the museum. And in the year 2000, he really started digging into this. The facts were just not lining up with the, these historical manuscripts he was finding, not lining up with this book at all. At some point, Nathan interviewed the famous Joe Medicine Crow, the last war chief who was considered an authority. And by the way, I should mention, he was a World War II veteran and hero. He, he, Joe Medicine Crow led a successful war party. They stole 50 horses owned by the Nazi SS from a German camp. And as he rode off, he sang the Crow Honor Song. You have to love it. Well, Joe Medicine Crow was, he's not alive anymore, but he was the keeper of the memories of the tribe. And he said no. But there is a story, say, how did he get his name? Liver Eater, there is something to that, that story. Well, he was working for a trading post that had been attacked numerous times and many killed. And finally, the, you know, he was there and they said, well, 
the next time we're going to be ready. So there were 30 some warriors that came to raid again. They were ready for them. They chased them. They cornered them in a canyon. And in the canyon, with their repeating rifles, they killed them all. And they put them in a pile, the bodies. What do you do? Well, they had a pile of arms. They cut off the heads. They cut off the legs. They were making like piles for souvenirs. Souvenirs that they would use, they would carry out, bring to the river, and they would sell them to the tourists. Now at the bottom of one of these piles, there was one that was alive still. And this is, this is some probably truthful. You know, there are other stories, but the, Nathan said, there's probably some truth to this one. So he went over, John Johnson, and he took his knife out and stabbed, stabbed him, killed him. And inadvertently, with the entrails, the liver came out. And John Johnson bent over and he grabbed it in his hand and he looked up and he said, anybody want some raw liver? And they said, he stuck it in his beard and took a bite. Now the big bushy beard, you don't know if he took a bite or not. Nathan said he may not even have taken a bite, but that's what all the, the people, the other traders, the men that had hunted him down and whoever else was there is a bystander said, they said that he did that. So it's probably true, but he was a friend of the crow. I mean, later on he was with Calamity Jane. He was doing a, he was on one of those Wild West shows like Buffalo Bill. I think it was a competitor of Buffalo Bill and he was with Calamity Jane doing the show. And who did they use? Crow Indians, his friends. So he had, a, he had quite a big character. He was a practical joker too. He said he served in the army. He was a scout, 1877 in the Nez Pierce War. So it's not like he didn't do anything. But Nathan really, Nathan really put the story to rest. Now, I wanted to show you his grave. And I found his grave, his grave is in Cody. But sad to say that it's kind of a tourist trap and they wouldn't let me film his grave. So just to start off, he was, he died, I think in a retirement, old people, you know, he died old age in California, he was buried there. And then 1970s, they exhumed him, brought him to Cody, to this place called Trail, Trail Town, or Trails Town, I don't even know the name of it. And Robert Redford was a pallbearer and they buried him there. They gave him kind of a, a cool statue, but it's like the fake guy, liver eater at the fake place. You know, they have a bunch of uh, log cabins there. It's like a little fake tourist trap, little fake town. And they, this is the first ever in the history of this channel. They said no. We want people to pay 12 bucks to come see the grave. We don't want your viewers. We're not gonna let you film. No filming, so. I think it's kind of sad. I think it's really sad because, you know, he, legend and all, he is one of the legends. It's an American heritage. So you gotta go pay the 12 bucks. I think it's, I think it's sad. 
So anyway, I'll show some pictures of the grave, which you can easily see and get, pay for, uh, like Alamy on the internet. So I'll pay for the picture, for the license, and I'll show it to you here. That's the story of the liver eater, the real man. I had my dreams kind of crushed on the liver eater, but it's good to know the real story. And all I can say is he did lead an interesting life, no matter what you say, no matter what's true or untrue. He was here. He wasn't really with the mountain men. I mean, it was a generation of the guys that I was talking about, the rendezvous, the 1825 to 1840. They, he was, a, he was, he was a little kid then, so he couldn't have been the keel boats and Ashley's 100, no. So it's all, it's fiction, like I say, the Wild West, a lot of this frontier stuff, Wild Bill and Doc Holliday. It's 50% right. You have to make up your own mind what, to, what you're gonna believe. You try to get as many facts, you piece it together and it might be 80% right. We'll never know. But that is the mystery of the Western frontier. The imagination. It's just fascinating stuff. It's the stuff of legend and dreams, guys. Legend and dreams. So long from Yellowstone. Beautiful Yellowstone, our, our national heritage. A jewel. It's just a jewel.